Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Yemi. And I just want to say, so excited about doing this. I've kind of been roped into this in the last minute because poor old Carly has just lost her voice. But we do have a fireside chat later on this afternoon that we're hoping that she can make. We are very privileged today to have three people who are demonstrating to us that compassion and high performance can actually go together. And in this short time we've got, which is just under half an hour, and we are appreciative that we stand between you and lunch, <laughs> is that you're going to hear some really practical examples of how they have managed to ensure that there are these kind of business cases around compassion and gaining commitment from valued talent. We have some case studies, we're going to hear from each of them, and I'd like to introduce you now. Firstly, we have Amy. Amy Wallace is the Chief of People and Culture at the Australian Olympic Committee. The AOC is a non-profit organisation who is responsible for selecting, sending and funding Australian teams to the Olympic Summer and Winter Games, Youth Olympic Games and the Regional Games. So if we're talking about high performance, don't think you can get more high performance than the Olympics. She brings her human resources and transformational leadership and 20 years experience to the AOC and is rolling out some key strategic people and culture initiatives. Can we just give a welcome and a round of applause to Amy. <laughs> Next we have Anna. So Anna is the Chief People Officer at Safety Culture, which is a software as a service company with an inspiring mission to improve the safety, quality and efficiency of workplaces around the world. Anna utilises 20 plus years of experience in unleashing the strategic power of people to accelerate business growth. And I was just talking to Anna before, who was mentioning some of the successes that this company has had, and we are very lucky to have this really great news Australian story. So please welcome Anna. And finally, we have Ada. Ada Guan is the CEO and co-founder of Rich Data Corporation. She has a background in computer science and in 2016 used those skills to found, co-found Rich Data Corporation. This provides a platform which harnesses the potential of AI combined with industry experience to deliver transformational change to business lending. Please let's welcome Ada. So as I said, we want to really hear the specific stories and examples that, that uh, they're all going to share. So firstly, we want to ask, Amy, what does leading with compassion mean in a practical sense? And I think this is good because we all talk about it, so much theory, but what does it mean to the Olympic Committee, the Australian Olympic Committee, in a practical sense? I'm so excited to be talking about compassion and leadership because what it means is really giving leaders in the organisation permission to actually have a human first approach in, in how they are dealing with people. And, and for us at the AOC, we're a small organisation. We have about uh, 50, go up to about 60 people in the lead up to a game. So we're just about 12 months out from Paris at the moment. It's not just looking after our people, but we then have a number of volunteers who, who travel with us to games. Uh, going into to Paris, we have a HQ team of about 130 people, plus all the entourage and coaches, et cetera, that, that travel with the team, all wanting to create a high performance environment for athletes to perform at their best. But on the other side of that, we wanna make sure the experience of a games is one that continues to enable them to be advocates of the Olympic games of the Olympic movement. And so the things that we really need to do is make sure that there is permission through culture and the experience that people have of the Olympic committee or the, and, and the Olympic movement is one that gives permission to have a human first approach to dealing with any situation that comes first. So the underpinning of that is creating a culture of compassion or thinking about how uh, your people experience the organisation to create that safe environment from that human first approach. 
That's fantastic. Thank you. And I think what you have the challenge about is that it's not a static culture of people involved in that culture. It's moving and morphing, and I can't imagine what it's like with stress levels and things like that when you're getting closer and closer to the deadlines, plus working with not just the one event, with working with multiple events as well. Definitely. I, I think the coming, the trans, like it'd be like working with uh, transient workforces yeah. or casual workforces where you've got different people coming in and out. And how do you, for example, with games, the athletes hit the ground and there's two weeks that they're with us and we need to work out how we can build a culture so when they hit the ground they're experiencing that and then can take it with them thereafter. Fantastic. Thank you, Amy. Anna, how about you? What does leading with compassion mean in a, in a practical sense for safety culture? So for those that don't know anything about safety culture, we were born out of a garage in Townsville. <laughs> we're a tech company. Um, and essentially, my founder was a private investigator who would spend his life in the backseat of our cars going around and spying on people that had compensation claims that uh, the insurer thought were, were um, not you know, not legitimate. And what he realised as he went and photographed all of these people was that um, many people, when they get injured at work, it's very legitimate. And there's no amount of financial compensation that can recover, that can cause a recovery for that human being. And so we wanted to disrupt the industry and we wanted to create cultures where people were safe at work. Uh, so that's at the very heart of you know, who we are as a business. But then we sat around and had conversations about, well, you know, who, what do we want to be uh, as a company? And so how can we help our team members, whilst we have policies that affect everyone collectively, how can we ensure that every single individual that works with us has a felt sense that they're cared for as an individual? Uh, and so that was a challenge that we really rose to where we started to think about, well, what would we do if someone came to us, and trigger warning here for some of this stuff is, is sensitive, um, but we wanted to encourage our managers to talk to people about all of the messiness of life. You've heard about it from all of the different presenters today, but you don't leave your work, your, your home life at home when you come into work. So how do we give permission to our leaders? And training is absolutely, you know, you saw uh, Dr. Amy talk about that, that's key, but a big part of it is just permission, that there doesn't have to be this divide between home and work. And so we've implemented policies such as miscarriage policy, um, which pay, provides paid leave for specifically women recovering from the physical impacts of miscarriage at work. But that in turn has also encouraged all of our male leaders to talk about, you know, in my last company, you know, when I was trying to have a family, this was what we experienced as a couple. And I never talked about that in my last workplace. So it gives people permission to discuss things that if one in four pregnancies you know, ends in miscarriage, then we should be talking about these things with our people. We introduced um, paid family and domestic violence leave, particularly we noticed at the beginning of COVID where people were stuck at home and statistics will tell us that this is going on in, in households. So um, it's great that the government's finally stepped up with things like time off for, um, you know, like leave for this, but it's not paid. And we know that these sorts of situations mean that there is financial abuse as well, and there's a power dynamic there. So it didn't matter what was going on for our employees outside of work, we just wanted to create a space where whatever's going on for you, you can share that without judgment in an environment that's completely inclusive. And when you do that, people feel that sense of being cared for, even if they never need to ex you know, access one of those policies. And I really dearly hope that people don't, but if they do, we'll be there for them as a business. Anna, thank you. And uh, just to experience that compassion as looking at something that is us as a person, because of course we are all people. I'm someone who unfortunately has gone through a number of miscarriages, and that was, golly, my kids are now 13 and 16. And, you know, no one talked about it, even back then. And that's something I think which is so lovely. I hear we've been going for five years with this wellness festival. Some of these conversations weren't even had, maybe as, some, as early as five years ago. But now that you are implementing policies and taking, and I like what you said about, even if they don't hopefully have to use it, the fact that they know that you're sending that message of compassion, it's so powerful. Thank you, Anna. 
Ada, would you like to just share a little bit quickly about rich, Data Rich Company before, because you're the founder, right? This is your baby. It is my baby. So um, RDC is an AI business, right? So our vision is really building a global leading AI business from Australia, which we're super excited about. And uh, one of the key things we do in terms of uh, to the topic is we have a cultural principle called looking after yourself, your loved ones, and uh, then RDC, which is our business. And uh, the key reason for that is uh, if I was share a personal story, my father, she was quite ill for the last two, three years. And in that period, as a startup, it's hard, right? So as a founder, as a CEO, and uh, building a business is quite a difficult time. And uh, in that period, um, my board, my executive team has been super supportive and really helped me through a very, very personally, very difficult time. And uh, coming out of that, and uh, so discussing with our uh, talent team and uh, really to say, okay, how do we make sure that type of support is actually available for everyone? And uh, so not just me, and because I'm the founder, I'm the CEO, so that's available for me. How do we make sure the support is actually available for anyone? And uh, Tiana's point, when that life gets messy, how do we put the support behind people? Well, we, at the same time, we're competing in the AI space, we're competing in a tech industry, competing in a startup industry, which are tough, right? And uh, how do we put a principle in place to do that? I think that cultural principle become a principle we, st we really stick to and have been put in place, I think, for about 12 months now, and uh, it has been super effective. And I think you sharing your stories as the founder then, and it's not like this is just a certain echelon of the organization, that accessibility to everyone is just so important. Thank you. Amy, moving on, if we're looking at the second question, uh, it's all, it's all great and there's people are very responsive, but are there any challenges that you found in responding with empathy and kindness? Is there some people that maybe get a little bit confused or agitated? Yeah, I think the, the, there are two, or there's probably more than two challenges, but two challenges that um, we experience. And, and the first one is that when you're dealing with things that um, are potentially related to a trauma or very personal or family related, everyone's response is really different. And so everyone's expectations are really different where you might think they just wanna to talk to their manager. Sometimes they want a broader response or more people checking in and some people don't want to. And so thinking about how you continue to um, lead with compassion and think about that human-centered response is uh, really having the confidence to ask the questions, well, how do you want me to work with you and support you in this? And do you want me to let people know and, and letting that individual really drive that outcome? It's not like you can um, draw a square and, and have someone sit in a box. And yeah. this, is, this is how we deal with someone to deal with compassion when they have a challenging situation to deal with. So I think um, that's one of the really big challenges. And I think, and I think Anna's uh, alluded to that as well, just um, giving managers the confidence to ask questions and reach out. And, and we're so drilled into us now about privacy and letting people have privacy and, and don't need to share this information. So we're really cautious about that. And so how do we ask leaders to lean in and ask questions of potentially really personal situations when we're say, saying on the other hand, everything's private, don't share this, don't talk about these things. So giving um, people the tools to really deal with that. One of the things that we have done within our organisation is um, ha had a, a large number of people do the mental health first aid certification, which really helps to deal with that situation. And someone on the earlier session was talking um, about not trying to be the psychologist or the counsellor, but just being there yeah. to be a person. And that mental health um, first aid is really helpful in really identifying the difference of, of how to do that. But as you think about those challenges, it's what are the mechanisms as an organisation that you can put in place to enable people, whether, they're, whether they are a, a manager or a hierarchical leader or just a, a leader within the organisation because they're a great person within the organisation. How do you give them the tools to ask those right questions um, 
to, to make sure you're personalising that approach and making that person feel comfortable, so that human-centred approach, as well as the confidence to actually ask questions and delve in and get more detail and more information to, to put that right support network around, around that person. That's fabulous. Thank you, Amy. And, and the, the mental health first aid, we've got Are You OK here. That's the great thing is there are so many resources. And it's not just the privacy, it's us as Australians and Kiwis can have the slight discomfort <laughs> about getting a little bit too personal. So for you to provide them confidence by, by giving them the tool sets and the mechanisms to be human-centred, that's, I mean, this could be saving lives, couldn't it? Because someone might ask a question and get someone opening up who had no one else to talk to. Thank you. Anna, how about you? Challenges? Yeah, I think um, our, we're a scaling tech company, so the average age of our workforce is about 30, which means we have lots of 20-something-year-olds in our business. Um, and I think one of the challenges that we've found as we really lead with heart is that managers need to know how to set a boundary. Otherwise, it can just go too far. Um, and so an example of that is we have, our miscarriage policy is 10 paid days for any woman that needs to seek medical treatment as the result of miscarriage. And that's the intention of it. It's so that they don't have to use their annual leave because it's not a holiday. And it's so they don't have to use their sick leave because that might be for throughout the year when they're sick, you know, with a cold or the flu. That's the intention of the policy. And, you know, only the other week I had a, a young man who was saying to me, well, you know, my partner partner has unfortunately had a miscarriage and I want those 10 days. Um, and, and that's not what the intention of it was. And so I think where our leaders, when we talked about leading with heart, they can almost, without those boundaries and coming back to what is the intention of why this policy was brought in, just reminding them of that and getting them to feel comfortable to engage in a tricky situation where someone's asking for something and how do I navigate that and giving them the skills for that. Oh, thank you, Anna. Gosh, because boundaries are something that is so important. Mm. And again, it hasn't always been talked about and people feel like they need to be appropriate. And of course, I need to give it to him because he's asked for it. But to, I think just bringing it right back to what was the intention is really, really powerful. Mm. Thank you. Ada, how about you? How about, how about challenges mm. within Data Rich Co? Uh, I think one of the challenges is when the answer is not that straightforward uh -huh. and uh, then what do you do about it, right? So um, if I was to give a, an example, um, some of our, one of our data scientists, uh, which is the core of our business, actually used to be flipping burgers in Hungry Jack. So drop out of university, he was flipping burgers. And uh, on the other side, he's also have such a brilliant mind. Mm -hmm. His coding is next level, right? So and uh, when this type of choice is in front of you and uh, to decide offer employment or not offer employment, so no formal education, data scientist is the core of the business. But as far as he's capable of to do what he, he does, and uh, so we chose to, to actually provided the role to Simon, which is flourishing as we speak, and wow. so which are super exciting. Well, that's certainly an example of valued talent, isn't it? That is what this is all about. Fantastic, thank you. So how important is your team's perspective in leading with compassion, and how do you suspend judgment? Because sometimes team members can come up with things that we, we are personally maybe a little bit confronted by, and as we've all said, we're dealing with some sensitive conversations. Amy, how about you? Uh, definitely um, listening to, so one of our values is listen and learn. So it's right. one of our strongest values actually um, that we have and, and listening to our people is, is something we do in, in all, of, all of the things that we do. Um, we have a work health and safety steering group or committee uh, which we use to seek feedback on and we had a situation recently where we had a couple of team members um, in the Solomon Islands when the earthquake hit and uh, one of our employees was um, injured in that, that sense and we um, thought we were doing the right thing and had her manager and her senior manager check in on her and um, made sure she had all of the right support available to her. And, and um, after that situation, we got some really strong feedback that um, she expected more from us. Um, and, and so um, we took that as an opportunity to actually listen. So she's now working with um, my team to 
what are the processes that we will go to to make sure we meet the expectations of our employees in a situation where it was um, potentially a traumatic experience. We had a couple of people there. One person was, uh, it was nothing. It was kind of okay, everything was fine. And the other person, it was um, a much more challenging experience for them. And so working with that person to go, well, what are the questions at what point in time should we ask to make sure that we're checking in in a way that makes you feel supported um, or not supported by the organisation, but also, as I was saying before, that really personalised approach to, to leading with passion. And, and so now I think, although the experience post that experience with us um, wasn't positive for her, that listen and learning from that as an organisation has been really important to us. And I think that's our approach to a lot of that leading with compassion um, and, and giving people permission to provide feedback. And it, you know, I can sit back and say, well, at least she were, felt comfortable giving yeah. us that feedback as well, which meant that we were able to take action on it. So I think the best thing to do is there will be hiccups along the way and you won't always get it right. And you need to give your leaders permission to not get it right, mm. but also be prepared to listen and take action when, when you do get that feedback that it's not, not worked out appropriately. Thank you, Amy. Well, as Anna said, so much of the stuff we've put in place with a hope that it is never actually going to end up eventuating. And a lot of us don't know how we would respond to in that situation, do we? And she probably didn't know how she would have responded to and what her needs were. So an awful experience, but to learn from it and implement some strategies for people who respond that way is just so powerful. Thank you. Anna, how about you, the team's perspective? I think the team's perspective on all of this stuff is so critical because that's essentially why you're doing it. Um, you know, we, we could care less about the awards that we might win externally. Uh, the intention behind why we're taking this action is so that every single individual feels cared for. That is the intention that's our primary focus. And I think when you do that, the awards and, and the other things start to come. And that was a way of us testing um, you know, it's the only way to compare yourselves. Like we, we think, and our internal feedback that we ask for every single week, we have a rolling tool of feedback that anyone can contribute to every week, and that gives us all the trends on an ongoing basis as to how we're performing. Uh, but that listening, as Amy said, is so key to that. And when you do that well, we entered some of these um, awards to just see, well, how do we compare against other organisations? And then we were really pleasantly surprised when we came out as you know, the number one best place to work in the Philippines, the third best place to work in Australia, where you know, in all the other regions we operate, where we've been a top five finisher, which tells us, well, we're doing something right. And so we want to just keep making sure that we do more of that as we scale. Fantastic. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, that's that whole thing, isn't it? We talked right at the beginning that high-performing teams and compassion can go together, award-winning teams. And so the focus to be on this can have the, the, the commercial gains as well. Ada. Yeah. Um, so we're relatively small, right? So we're about 60 people organisation. So one of the key thing I think we, we're really focusing on is what is our purpose. And uh, so I think the previous panel also talking about purpose. Purpose for me is a guiding principle. And uh, so our purpose is around inclusion. So when really thinking about leading the team and how the team can embrace the empathy and the being compassion, it's really going back to our purpose. So if the purpose is around inclusion, um, I think I share Simon's story, that's an inclusion story. And it's around how to use the purpose really driving some of the, the critical decisions for the organization. Thank you. I just, how long ago did you start the company up, Ada? Sorry, uh, seven years ago. Seven years ago. So for you to create something that is so purpose driven, I'm sure you've worked in organisations before, I'm sure you've all worked in organisations before that maybe didn't have a focus on compassion. But when we hear things about people's values like, um, like purpose and like learning, and remember what we're talking about here is evaluating the business case for leading with compassion, and how to gain commitment from valued talent. Can you imagine the commitment from the valued talent for each of these three organisations? Very different organisations and potentially implementing it in a different way, but just that that creates dividends both in the culture and commercially. So you've had a really short amount of time to listen to this and I want to thank you. Such generosity and sharing from all three of you. So 
have a think over lunch and again just all these amazing ideas and things that you've heard over these last couple of days what could you do there are people who are doing these things that are possible on market and Ada and Amy and Anna are all going to be around feel free to pop up have a bit of a conversation with them but this is what just absolutely epitomizes this this festival which is all about wellness and just thinking about how these changes can really make an impact on your people. And so uh, before we, uh, we, we say thank you very much for these three, I'd like to hand it back over to Yami. Thank you. Okay, we'll say thank you now. Yes, thank you very much. I'm sorry, can we give a proper round of applause to these three wonderful leaders? Thank you so much. And thank you, Laurel, for stepping in and doing such a wonderful job on, on such a topic. Thank you. Um, look, if I can.